students welcome back our planet earth is blessed with a bewildering variety of life forms that includes different types of animals birds and other organisms they are all different from one another to a greater or lesser extent for example if you compare yourself with your friend you both will be different in means of your height weight skin color hair color size and shape of nose etc however we can say that those differences are negligible when we compare those aspects with a monkey if you are asked to compare a man with a butterfly you will conclude that a monkey has a lot more common features like us than a butterfly over these millions of years a variety of life forms evolved on this earth from a very small microscopic bacteria to the largest whales living on earth some pine trees live thousands of years while insects like mosquitoes die within a few days life on earth includes transparent worms on one hand and colorful birds and flowers on the other hand it is difficult to understand all these organisms one by one as there are many of them instead we will look for the similarities among these organisms which will allow us to classify them into different classes and study the classes as a whole from ancient times people tried to classify animals into different groups for understanding them great thinker aristotle classified animals based on their habitat that is where they live according to him organisms can be classified based on whether they live on land water or air but this cannot be considered as an appropriate way of classification as land animals includes frogs dogs humans etc which are different from each other in many ways later biologists tried to classify organisms based on their appearances and characteristics characteristic is a particular feature or a function of an organism for example we have five fingers that is a characteristic we are walking on two limbs that is a characteristic of human beings a group of organisms which have similar characteristics can be classified into single group let's see how we can use characteristics to classify organisms first classification is based on cell type based on cell types organisms can be divided into two prokaryotic organisms and eukaryotic organisms those organisms which lack membrane bound organelles and a nuclear membrane they come under prokaryotic cell prokaryotic cell doesn't has nuclear membrane and membrane bound organelles organisms which have a membrane around their cell organelles and their nucleus come under eukaryotic cell they perform specialized functions example of eukaryotic organisms are plants and animals whereas example of prokaryotic organism is a bacteria next classification is based on the number of cells based on number of cells organisms can be classified into two unicellular organism and multicellular organism unicellular organism has single cell whereas multicellular organism has more than one cell in multicellular organisms the labor is divided cells are not identical in them as they perform different functions amoeba is a unicellular organism in which all the functions are performed by a single cell next classification is based on producing food by photosynthesis that is based on their nutrition based on nutrition organisms can be classified into two autotrophs and heterotrophs autotrophs can make their food by photosynthesis heterotrophs depend upon others for their survival next classification is based on the level of organization and development of organs there are mainly four levels of organization cellular level 
tissue level, organ level and organ system level. First one is cellular level. Second is tissue level. In tissue level, cells perform same function unite to form tissues. Third one is organ level. Tissues group together to form organs. And the last one is the organ system level in which the organs group together to form organ system. From the millions of different forms of life present today on earth, scientists classified the organisms into different groups based on their similarities and dissimilarities. It is called classification. The organisms are divided into different groups based on their similarities and dissimilarities. That is the classification. Classification of these organisms will be closely related to evolution. You might be familiar with the term heritable characters. Heritable characters are those which are passed on to offsprings from parents. A change in these heritable characters over successive generations is called evolution. The organisms which are present in ancient world were far simpler than the organisms present today. The simple organisms become complex by the accumulation of changes in their body which will help them to survive the conditions around them. Charles Darwin first described the idea of evolution in 1859 in his book The Origin of Species. When we connect this idea of evolution to classification, we will find some groups of organisms which have ancient body designs and have not changed from simpler body designs. These organisms are referred to as primitive organisms or lower organisms. Primitive organisms are a group of organisms which have ancient body designs and have not changed much from their very simple type of body designs. These organisms are the primitive organisms. But some organisms have acquired their body designs recently. These are called advanced or higher organisms. Some changes have occurred in their body designs to adapt to the new environment or extreme environment. In other words, we can say some are older organisms and some are younger organisms. Older organisms are simpler when compared to the complex younger organisms. Any system in which the members are ranked one above the other is called a hierarchy. Biologists such as Ernest Haeckel, Robert Whittaker and Carl Woos try to classify all living organisms into broad categories called kingdoms. Kingdom is the highest level of classification. Whittaker has proposed five kingdoms. Kingdom Monera. Kingdom Monera includes very simple organisms. Kingdom Protista includes some unicellular eukaryotic organisms. That means they have only one single cell and they have membrane bound organelles and a nuclear membrane is present around the nucleus. Fungi, they are heterotrophic eukaryotic organisms. Heterotrophic means they cannot produce their own food. They are eukaryotic organisms. Kingdom Plantae includes multicellular eukaryotes with cell walls like plants. Kingdom Animalia, includes multicellular eukaryotes without cell wall like animals. Let's look into a table for a better understanding of kingdoms. Organisms are classified into two prokaryotes and eukaryotes. You know that prokaryotes they do not have a nuclear membrane or membrane bound organelles and they are unicellular. They have only single cell. And these prokaryotic unicellular organisms are classified under the kingdom Monera. Eukaryotes, that means they have a nuclear membrane and membrane bound organelles are classified into unicellular and multicellular organisms. The organisms with a single cell and more than one cell. Eukaryotic unicellular organisms come under the kingdom Protista. 
whereas multicellular organisms can be again divided into two the organisms with the cell wall and organisms without cell wall the organisms with cell wall again classified into two first one those don't perform photosynthesis they don't have chlorophyll and they don't perform photosynthesis they come under the kingdom fungi the organisms perform photosynthesis come under the kingdom plantae multicellular organisms without a cell wall they come under the kingdom animalia now we know that kingdom is the highest level of classification and under each kingdom many subgroups will come naming the subgroups at various levels as given in the following scheme phylum class order family genus and species we classify the organisms into smaller and smaller groups and finally we arrive at the basic unit of classification the species the basic unit of classification is the species species include similar individuals which are capable of breeding or reproduce within their group for example humans horse mouse are examples of species now let's understand the important characteristics of the five kingdoms first the kingdom monera monera includes bacteria blue green algae blue green algae is also called cyanobacteria and mycoplasma they are unicellular organisms and come under prokaryotes as they lack a nuclear membrane or membrane bound organelles monera come under unicellular prokaryotic organisms some of them have cell walls and some of them don't these include both autotrophs and heterotrophs autotrophs can synthesize their own food by photosynthesis but heterotrophs get their food from the surroundings in the picture you can see the blue green algae examples of protista are algae diatoms amoeba and paramecium diatoms are single celled algae they have a yellowish brown pigment called xanthophyll the pigment is called xanthophyll xanthophyll gives them a golden brown color diatoms are found in oceans waterways and soil another examples are protozoans like amoeba and paramecium this group includes simple eukaryotic organisms with a single cell they are eukaryotes that means they have membrane bound organelles here you can see this is paramecium and there is a membrane around these organelles the membrane is present that's why they come under eukaryotes amoeba and paramecium have only a single cell here in paramecium you can see some hair like projections these hair like projections are called cilia some others have a whip like flagella cilia and flagella are appendages which help these organisms to move they include both autotrophs and heterotrophs some organisms can synthesize their own food by photosynthesis they come under autotrophs and others depend on other organisms for their survival examples of fungi are yeast molds and mushrooms they are heterotrophic eukaryotic organisms heterotrophic means they are not able to synthesize their own food they acquire food by absorbing dissolved molecules from the environment by secreting digestive enzymes for example imagine this as a microscopic fungus and it has digestive enzymes inside it and this fungus secretes digestive enzymes into the atmosphere and these enzymes will digest the molecules around it and then the fungus can absorb these digestive molecules some of them use decaying non living organic matter as food and they are called saprotrophs examples of saprotrophs are bacteria and mushrooms 
As mushrooms do not contain chlorophyll, they cannot synthesize their own food. So they obtain nutrition from dead plants. Hence, they are under saprotrophs. Other fungi are parasites. Parasites are organisms which live on a host organism and absorb food from them. Some fungi are parasites on plants and some others are parasites on humans. Some of them have the capacity to become multicellular organisms at certain stages of their lives. Their cell wall is made up of a complex sugar called chitin. Chitin gives structural stability to the fungus. Are you familiar with the term symbiosis? In symbiosis, Two species live in close relation with each other in which at least one species benefits. Some fungi live in mutually dependent relationship with blue-green algae and this relationship is called symbiotic relationships. And this blue-green and fungi relationship they are called lichens. We can see this lichen as the slow growing large colored patches on the bark of the trees. Next comes the kingdom plantae. Kingdom plantae includes all plants. There are more than 2,50,000 species in this group. They are eukaryotes with cell walls. They are autotrophs that means they can prepare their own food by means of photosynthesis. We will see the subgroups of this kingdom plantae later in this video. Next kingdom is Animalia. It includes all multicellular eukaryotic organisms without a cell wall. Plants have cell wall but animals lack cell wall. They are heterotrophs that depend on other organisms for their survival. Most of the animals are motile. As plantae. We will study the subgroups of kingdom animalia later in our slides. Now let's look into the table that describes the kingdom plantae. Kingdom plantae is first divided into two. One that don't have differentiated plant parts and those plants have differentiated parts. The plants which don't have differentiated parts come under thallophyta. And the plants which have differentiated parts is divided into two. The plants without vascular tissue and plants with vascular tissue. This vascular tissue help in the transportation of water and food into different parts of the plant. So the plants which lack vascular tissues, they come under bryophyta. And the plants with vascular tissue, they can be again divided into two plants which don't produce seeds and the plants produce seeds. The plants which don't produce seeds come under pteridophyta and the plants produce seeds they are called phanerogams. These phanerogams again divided into two the plants which bear naked seeds and the plants which bear seeds inside the fruit. The plants which bear naked seeds they come under gymnosperms and the plants which have seeds inside a fruit, they come under angiosperms. Then again this angiosperm is divided into two. Seeds with two cotyledons and seeds with one cotyledon. Cotyledon is a seed leaf within the embryo of a seed. I will explain in detail about the cotyledons in later slides. The plants with two cotyledons is called dicots and the plants with one cotyledon is termed as monocots. Now let's learn all these subgroups in detail. The first one, thallophyta. Examples of thallophyta are spirogyra, eulothrix and cladophora. This division includes plants without differentiated parts like roots, stems or leaves. Here you can see Spirogyra. They are very simple plants. They do not have roots, stem or leaves. Mainly they are seen in aquatic habitat that is in wet places. They are the primitive forms of plants with a simple body. 
Most of the members in this group, they prepare their own food. They have chlorophyll and they can prepare their own food. The plants in this group are commonly called as algae. They are very simple plants. They do not have roots, stems or leaves living in aquatic habitats and they are very primitive organisms with very simple body. And with chlorophyll, they are able to perform photosynthesis. Next is bryophyta. Examples of bryophyta are Moses, Marchantia and Funaria. They are called the amphibians of the plant kingdom. Amphibians can live in water and land like frog. Like that, bryophytes prefer moist places to live, but they can survive in dry habitat. In bryophytes, the male gametes are carried to the female gamete through the water. Like it happens in frog where the male sperms are carried by water to the eggs which are laid by the female frog. Like that in bryophytes the male gametes are carried to female gametes through the water. Due to these similarities bryophytes are called the amphibians in plant kingdom. The plant body is differentiated to have a stem and leaf like structure but there is no vascular tissue. To conduct water and food from one part of the plant to another. Here you can see the stem and a leaf like structure but they do not have this vascular tissue. Viscphon and dystonia are examples of pteridophyte. Plants in this group have differentiated body parts like root, stem and leaves. Here you can see this stem and these are leaf like structures and they have roots. They have vascular tissue. In bryophyta they don't possess vascular tissue but in pteridophyta they have vascular tissue that is the xylem and phloem for the conduction of water and food to different parts of the body. They don't produce flowers or seeds. These flowers and seeds are the features for reproduction in plants so that's why they are called cryptogams that means they have hidden reproductive organs pteridophyta don't produce these flowers of seeds that's why they are called cryptogams so pteridophyte don't have seeds we just learned that pteridophyte have differentiated plant parts but don't bear Seeds. Plants with well differentiated reproductive parts and ultimately the bare seeds are called phanerogams. They have reproductive structures and as a result they produce seeds. Seeds consist of embryo along with stored food. This stored food help in the growth of embryo during germination. The development of a plant from a seed is called germination. So the food stored in this embryo will help in the development of that embryo. Phanerogams again classified on the basis of whether their seeds are naked or enclosed in a fruit. Gymnosperms they have naked seeds and angiosperms they have seeds enclosed in a fruit. Let's learn about gymnosperms. Examples of gymnosperms are pines, geodas and jingo. The word comes from two Greek words. Gymnos means naked and sperma means seed. That means naked seed. The seeds of gymnosperms develop either on the surface of a skin or leaf like appendages of corn. This is a pine tree and you can see the corn here. And in pine, these corns bear seeds. These corns bear seeds. One corn produces two seeds beneath each scale. Here you can see the scales. And beneath this scale, one corn produces two seeds. These seeds remain in the corn until it dries out. These gymnosperms, they include conifers. Conifers are woody plants and most of them are trees. Conifers bear corn. Pine is an example of conifer as it has corn. Most of them are evergreen. That means they stay green year around.
Examples of angiosperms are mustard, beans, apples, garlic, onions and wheat. They are flowering plants. The word angiosperm comes from two Greek words. Angio means covered and sperma means seed. That means covered seed. That means the seed is inside the fruit. The seed develop inside an ovary and this ovary finally becomes the fruit. The plant embryo inside the seed have the structures called cotyledons. As I already explained, cotyledons are called seed leaves because they emerge and become green when the seed germinates. For example, this is a bean plant, bean embryo. This is a bean embryo. And here is the plant part which becomes the stem. And here this area is the cotyledon. This area is the cotyledon. These cotyledons are seed leaves and they emerge and become green when the seed germinates. This angiosperm further classified on the basis of the number of cotyledons present in the seed. If two cotyledons are present, they are called dicots and if one cotyledon is present, they are called monocot. This is a bean plant and here we can see two cotyledons. See here, one cotyledon is here and one on the other side. Two cotyledons are there. These cotyledons supply nutrition to the plant embryo which is necessary for the germination. When it germinates and become a plant, it can synthesize its own food by photosynthesis. Whereas in wheat, we can see only one cotyledon. This is a wheat plant and here we can see this one cotyledon only one cotyledon is here and hence the wheat is a monocot if we soak the seed of green gram overnight it becomes tender and if you try to split the seed it will split into two equal halves this each half is a cotyledon only the seeds of dicot plant splits like equal halves as they have two cotyledons monocot seeds don't split into Two equal halves. Monocots and dicots differ in their stem, root and leaves. Monocot seed has only one cotyledon. Here you can see this is cotyledon. Only one cotyledon is there in monocot and here you can see two cotyledons. Dicot seeds have two cotyledon. And in monocot, fibrous root is present. Fibrous root is formed by thin, moderately branching roots from the stem. Whereas dicots have taproot. Taproot is a large, central and dominant root. Here you can see one dominant root is there in the center. And the roots arises laterally from the dominant root. That is a tap root. Monocots have parallel venation on their leaves as the veins are arranged parallel to one another on the leaf lamina. Whereas dicot leaves have reticulate venation on their leaves as the veins are arranged as a network all over the lamina. Monocot flower has three petals. Monocots have three petals whereas dicot have four to five petals. Now let's recap the kingdom plantae. Kingdom plantae is divided into two based on whether they have differentiated plant parts or not. Plants which do not have differentiated parts come under Talophyta and the plants which have differentiated parts again divided into two. The plants without vascular tissue and the plants with vascular tissue. The plants without vascular tissue come under bryophyta and the plants with vascular tissue is again divided into two on the basis whether they produce seeds or not. The plants which do not produce seeds, they come under pteridophyta but the plants produce seeds 
they are called phanerogams. These phanerogams again divided into two based on whether they bear naked seeds or seeds inside the fruit. The plants which have naked seeds, they come under gymnosperms. We saw the pine tree and the plants which bear seeds inside the fruit, they are called angiosperms. Again, this angiosperm is divided into two. The seeds with two cotyledons, that is the seed leaves. The seeds with two cotyledons come under dicots and the seeds with one cotyledon come under monocots. That's it about plant kingdom. Moving on to kingdom animalia. All the animals are members of the kingdom animalia. They are eukaryotic multicellular and heterotrophic. Eukaryotic means they have a nuclear membrane and membrane bound organelles. They have more than one cell and heterotrophic means they cannot synthesize their own food by means of photosynthesis. They have to depend on other organisms for their survival. Unlike plants, the cells of animals don't have a cell wall. Let's learn about the subdivisions in Kingdom Animalia. Let's learn which all phylums are under Kingdom Animalia. Porifera, Cylindrata, Platyhelminthus, Nematoda, Annelida, Arthropoda, Mollusca, Echinodermata, Protocordata and Vertebrata. Let's learn about them. First, Porifera. They are commonly called sponges. Animals come under porifera have body full of pores and channels allowing water to circulate through them. This water will bring food and oxygen for their survival. This water flow helps in waste dispersal from their body. They don't have a nervous system, digestive system or circulatory system. Most of them inhabits seas. They are non-motile animals and they are attached to some solid support. These are covered with a hard outside layer or skeleton. You can see here in sponge, you can clearly see this hard outer cover is there and these sponges are attached to some solid support. They cannot move from one place to another and the full body of this porifera or sponge consists of pores for the movement of water. The body involves very minimal differentiation and division into tissues. Moving on to cylindrata. It includes corals, jellyfish, sea animal, hydras etc. More than 9000 living species are there in this phylum. They are present in all marine and freshwater environment. Their body has a single opening and it is surrounded with sensory tentacles to capture the prey. Here you can see these are corals. Tentacles are there. This is jellyfish. Jellyfish has tentacles. These are the tentacles of sea anemone. And these cylindrates are called nidarians. They are called nidarians as they contain a special structure called nidocyte on their tentacles. This nidocyte, nidocyte is present in their tentacles and this nidocyte has nidocyst. Nidocyst is there inside the nidocyte and this nidocyst deliver a sting to the other organisms. This nidocyst helps in capturing prey and save them from the predators. The tentacles are surrounded by a spacious cavity and that cavity is called cylinderon and that's why the name cylinderate. Their bodies have two cell layers namely ectoderm and endoderm. Ectoderm makes up cells on the outside of the body and endoderm makes the inner lining of the body. So these cylindrates they are also called nidarians as these tentacles contain nidocyte which bear nidocyst 
and this nidosis deliver a sting to the other organisms and by this means they capture their prey and there is a cavity around the tentacles and it is called the cylinderon hence the name cylinderates now comes the platyhelminthes planarians and liver flukes are examples of platyhelminthes they are either free living or parasitic parasitic means the organisms live on a host organism and absorb food from that host example of free living animal is planarians and parasitic is liver flukes Liver flukes are parasites of liver of many mammals. The word platyhelminthes comes from two Greek words. Platy means flat and helminth means worm. So they are called flatworms. Their bodies are dorsoventrally flattened. Dorsoventrally means top to bottom. Here in planaria you can see from top to bottom the body is flattened. Hence they are called flatworms. they are invertebrates means they don't develop a vertebral column or backbone or spine they are bilaterally symmetrical animals their right and left body halves are mirror images of each other for example if we draw a line in the middle of the body the right and left halves they are mirror images of each other the body is bilaterally symmetrical they have three cell layers unlike cylindrates which have only two layers platyhelminthes have ectoderm mesoderm and endoderm as they have three layers they are called triploblastic ectoderm give rise to nervous system and skin mesoderm give rise to muscles and connective tissue and endoderm give rise to digestive system they are acelomate animals acelomate animals lack a body cavity or that body cavity is called coelom in this coelom the well developed body organs are accommodated as it is acelomate they don't have a coelom and they don't have any well developed organs moving on to nematoda they are free living and parasitic nematodes parasitic are round worm pin worm and filarial worm filarial worm causes elephantiasis they are very small worms some nematodes are microscopic they are also called round worms as their body is cylindrical rather than flattened here you can see the round worm their body is cylindrical not flattened they have a tubular digestive system with openings at both the ends they are triploblastic having three cell layers ectoderm mesoderm and endoderm their body is bilaterally symmetrical as the two halves are mirror images of each other there are tissues but no real organs are present they have a pseudocoelom unlike platyhelminthes which are a coelomate nematodes have pseudocoelom a true coelom is a cavity which is completely surrounded by mesodermal tissue but pseudocoelom is not completely surrounded by mesodermal tissue nematoda possess pseudocoelom moving on to annelida earthworms and leeches are examples of annelids they are also called ringed worms or segmented worms here you can see in earthworms here there are rings you can see or segments that's why they are called ringed worms annelids are bilaterally symmetrical organisms their body halves are mirror images of each other they are triploblastic as they have three cell layers ectoderm endoderm and mesoderm they have a true coelom a true cavity to pack all the organs inside it they are invertebrates without a vertebral column they have parapodia for locomotion parapodia are small lateral outgrowths from the body their body is divided into segments which lined up one after other from head to tail here you can see these segments these segments are lined after one another from the head to the tail they are found in fresh water 
marine water as well as on land. Arthropoda. Examples of arthropods are prawns, butterflies, houseflies, spiders, scorpions and crabs. It is the largest group of animals. Arthropods are invertebrates animals with an exoskeleton. Here you can see this is the exoskeleton. Here you can see this is the exoskeleton. This exoskeleton protects and supports an animal's body. They have segmented body and paired joined appendages. These are paired appendages. You can see these legs. They are paired and their body is segmented. Segmented means it is divided into head, thorax and abdomen. Body is divided into head, thorax and abdomen. The word arthropod means joined leg. They have an open circulatory system. That means blood does not flow in well-defined blood vessels like us. We have a closed circulatory system. The blood flows through blood vessels. But in arthropoda, it is not like that. Blood vessels are absent. They have an open circulatory system. The coelomic cavity is filled with blood. Moving on to mollusca. The examples of mollusca are snails and mussels. They are the second largest group in invertebrate animals after arthropoda. They live in marine, freshwater and land habitats. They have a bilaterally symmetrical body. They have a calcareous exoskeleton which protects the internal soft body. This is the exoskeleton. It is very hard. It's calcareous means it contains calcium carbonate. They have an open circulatory system and kidney-like organs for excretion. There is a muscular foot which helps in moving around. Examples of echinodermata are sea stars and sea urchins. The word echinodermata comes from two Greek words. Echinos means hedgehog and derma means skin. Hence, they are spiny skinned organisms. They have a radial symmetry. Radial symmetry means these organisms have similar parts regularly arranged around a central axis. This is starfish and here you can see this is a central axis and all the parts are regularly arranged from the central axis. Hence, it has radial symmetry. They all are marine animals. Echinodermata has no fresh water or land members. All are marine. They have calcareous plates on skin means their skeleton is composed of calcium carbonate. They are triploblastic with three cell layers, ectoderm, endoderm and mesoderm and they have a coelomic cavity to fit the organs inside it. There are a series of fluid filled canals arising from coelomic cavity. Helps in gas exchange, feeding, sensory reception and locomotion. Fluid filled canals, they are arising from coelomic cavity. And these fluid filled canals help in gas exchange, feeding, sensory reception and locomotion. Examples of protocordates are balanglosis, herdmania and amphioxus. The animals come under protocordates have bilaterally symmetrical body. They are triploblastic with three cell layers and they have a true coelom for the organs to fit inside. They have a special feature called notochord at some stages of their lives. The notochord is a long rod-like structure that runs along the back of the animal. This is not a pot. It separates the nervous tissue from the gut. Don't confuse a notochord with a spine. The animals which have a spine don't retain the notochord. This notochord gives support to the animal's body. The muscles are attached to this notochord which will give an ease for the movement. But the protochordates might not have a proper notochord for the ender stages of life. They are marine animals. 
Now comes the vertebrata. The animals under vertebrata have a vertebral column and internal skeleton, endoskeleton. Till now we saw exoskeleton which protects the inside of the body and in vertebrata we have an endoskeleton which protects the body and muscles are attached to the skeleton for movement. They have a bilaterally symmetrical body, triploblastic with three cell layers. They have a coelomic cavity for the organs to fit and their body is segmented. Vertebrates have a notochord which is a long rod like structure we just saw the notochord this rod like structure is running along the back of the body and the notochord mainly presents in the early stage of embryo later it becomes a part of the vertebral column this notochord later becomes a part of the vertebral column dorsal nerve cord is a unique feature to chordates it is an embryonic structure which develops into central nervous system that means the brain and the spine. This dorsal nerve cord develops into the brain and spine. Dorsal nerve cord is dorsal to the notochord. Imagine that this is a vertebrate. This is a vertebrate body. And this is notochord which is a rod like structure running along the back of the body. And this notochord becomes a part of the vertebral column in the later stages of the life. And dorsal nerve cord is present on the dorsal side of the notochord. This dorsal nerve cord gives rise to the brain and spine. They have paired gill pouches. Gill pouches are respiratory in function. Vertebrates are grouped into six classes. Cyclostomata, pieces, amphibia, reptiles, aves, and mammalia. Now let's learn each of them in detail. The first one is cyclostomata. Lamprey and hag fishes are examples of cyclostomata. They are jawless vertebrate fishes. They have jawless mouth and with, they have horny structures that functions as teeth. Cyclostomata means a round mouth. They have an elongated eel-like body, slimy skin and have no scales. Here you can see this is lamprey and the body is really elongated and they have no scales. They are ectoparasites means they live on the outside body of the host. Human lice are an ectoparasite like that. Animals come under cyclostomata are ectoparasites. Lampreys are ectoparasites on other vertebrate fishes. They have well developed eyes with one or two dorsal fin and one tail fin. This is dorsal fin and this is tail fin. And a single nostril is present on the top of the head. The name pisces means fishes in Latin. They are true fishes. They have jaws supported by a skeleton. They are exclusively aquatic animals. Their skin is covered with scales and plates. We know that on the skin of the fishes we can see the scales. They have gills for respiration which help to breathe the dissolved oxygen in water. Fishes have a streamlined body. Streamlined body tapers at both the ends. Here you can see this shark has streamlined body. The body tapers at both the ends and they have a muscular tail which help in the movement. They are called blooded animals. Called blooded animals cannot maintain a constant body temperature. It varies with atmospheric temperature. But warm-blooded animals can maintain a constant temperature regardless of their surroundings. Humans are warm-blooded. We maintain a constant body temperature no matter we are in extreme cold or hot. But fishes are cold-blooded animals. Their heart have only two chambers. Unlike our heart which has four chambers, they lay eggs. Some fishes skeleton is made entirely of cartilage like in shark but other skeleton is made up of both bone and cartilage like in tuna. Frogs 
tarts and salamanders are examples of amphibians. They live in a wide range of habitats ranging from land to aquatic. Most of the amphibians start their lives as larvae living in water. They don't have scales on their skin as fishes. They have mucus glands on their skin. Here in frogs you can see the mucus glands on the skin. And this mucus gland secretions help in gas exchange. They have three chambered heart unlike two chambered heart of fishes. Respiration is through either gills or lungs. Larvae breathe with the help of gills and adults with the help of lungs. Some terrestrial salamanders and frogs lack lungs so they rely on mucus gland secretions for the gas exchange. Snakes, turtles, lizards and crocodiles are examples of reptiles. Reptiles are also called blooded animals and their body have scales. They breathe through lungs. Most of them have three chambered heart but crocodile has four chambered heart like humans. Some of them lay eggs with hard outer cover. This hard outer cover will protect the egg from extreme harsh open environment. They don't have an aquatic larval stage like in amphibians. All birds fall in the category of aves. They are warm-blooded animals. That means they maintain a constant body temperature regardless of the outer environment. They have a four-chambered heart. They lay eggs. They breathe through lungs. Their feathers are covered by a waxy coating that protects the birds from water as their feathers contain a water soluble protein. So to protect from water they have a waxy coating on their feathers. Their forelimbs are modified for flight. Most mammals are intelligent. Some possess large brains. They are warm blooded animals that they can maintain a constant body temperature regardless of their surroundings. They have four chambered heart. Most of the mammals give birth to their young ones. However, platypus and echidna lay eggs. Here you can see in the picture platypus. This platypus lay eggs unlike other mammals. Kangaroos give birth to very poorly developed young ones which will develop further in the pouch outside the body. They have mammary glands for the production of milk to nourish the young ones. Their skin has hairs, oil glands and sweat glands. That's it about the chapter diversity in living organisms. If you like this video, please share it with your friends. If you have any queries, put it in the comment box. Thank you.